Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome again from the uh, DEC Forum to this uh, now fourth webinar in the series that we're running this year about DEC 10 R. My name is Rul Ottink, and I work for the DEC Forum, uh, heading the business development, and uh, will be the moderator for this event. Uh, once again, we have a very good number of people registered and already 81 people have joined um, and that's good to see. So this is the fourth webinar and today we're diving into the, uh, uh, the physical layer of uh, the technology. And our speaker today is uh, Heike Bell from company Nordic Semiconductor. Uh, Heike is the principal R&D engineer. And he's been working uh, in NCTC DECT for several years with the development of the NR Plus standard, and he's one of the major contributors to this work. Before I hand over to him, a few notes again. So the presentation this time will take a little bit more time, about 40 minutes, we believe, and then uh, during this, uh, these 40 minutes, you can ask questions. The questions button is at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And then after the presentation, we will answer your questions as much as, as possible and, and time allowing. Uh, but if there are too many questions, then uh, we'll answer them afterwards. And uh, we continue to work on the, uh, on the blog and, and the frequency, uh, frequently asked questions uh, page. Uh, the, Questions from the third webinar are not yet up there, but they will be next week. Uh, so please uh, take a look there. This webinar will again be recorded uh, and made available to everyone who is, uh, who is registered. So those are the notes to start with, and then uh, I will hand over to Heike. Okay, good afternoon from my, my side as well. Uh, and um, as I said, I, I've been working for Nordic Semiconductors for a while and uh, on this matter, working on the physical layer and now starting to work also on the conformance test specification. But without further ado, let's go to the deeper details of the physical layer. And I'm a bit sorry about the quality of the slides in a sense that this uh, Livestone platform see, seems to shrink the resolution a little bit. So the nasty details on, on the equations are a little bit hard to read, but hopefully we will survive. And the PDF should be downloadable with a full resolution, nevertheless. So you can read it from there. Uh, I believe the applications, use cases, features and benefits have been uh, quite deeply uh, covered in the previous presentations. So I will not go uh, in deep on those. I will just touch uh, a couple of things that the, the physical layer uh, does have an impact on the robustness, on the range and on the reliability of a single radio link. MAC and above layers then handle uh, how the band is used, how the spectrum is shared, how the mesh networking is done and, and so forth. But um, if I get questions about this, I can answer, but uh, now let's go to the physical layer itself. So starting from classic tech to the NR plus, what has happened? So uh tech 2020 or nr plus inherited the same frame structure 10 millisecond frame in uh, split into 24 time slots the channel raster is exactly the same and we use the same principle of free time frequency channel uh, evaluation uh, while selecting the uh, slot and carrier to operate on it was decided to use OFDM-based modulation uh, and do that, uh, we get the benefits in terms of the multiple path propagation resilience. 
We have a strong forward error correction code on the physical layer. Uh, hybrid ARQ is supported and thus overall we get over 10 dB link budget improvement compared to the classic text. So what is OFDM? Uh, I added these slides just to show you uh, the basic principles that signal is transmitted on those gray subcarriers. You see the familiar FFT equation on the top and what the transmitted spectrum looks like if you do not do any kind of a pulse shaping. So that's the kind of a basics of OFDM and why OFDM it basically tries to solve or solves the multipath propagation problem at system level by splitting the transmitted signal to a narrow subcarriers which can, which then are individually demodulated in the receiver. In a single carrier transmission you would need to implement quite complex uh, equalizer and here in OFDM the receiver structure is simpler in a multi-path multi uh, environment. OFDM is the basis of many of the modern radio systems such as Wi-Fi, 4G and 5G radio technologies. If we compare the transmitted signal of classic DECT, which is GMSK, which is a constant envelope signal, you see the signal constellation diagram in the top left corner where you really see that the envelope is constant, one, and compare it to the OFDM in the right hand side, uh, the constellation is really a furball. And you can see that in this OFDM signal, the peak to average ratio can be quite high. The sing sing signal power fluctuates uh, up to 10 dB. And spectrally, although the transmission bandwidth is approximately the same, uh, the spectrally the uh, signals look quite drastically or drastically different. Now, the NR plus uh, standard is quite scalable in terms of the OFDM waveform. We can support up to 221 megahertz nominal bandwidth. One can select to the implementation different subcarrier spacings from 27 kilohertz up to 216. The Fourier transform is scalable. Thus you are occupying from 1.5 to 190 megahertz of bandwidth. Physical layer has support up to eight MIMO streams and you can use various linear modulations on, on the transmitted subcarriers. And the packet lengths are variable. I highlighted in blue here some of configurations or a set of configurations which make sense uh, for a narrow bandwidth used in the uh, decked band. So typically you would use 27 or 54 kilohertz uh, subcarrier spacing and Fourier transforms of 64 or, or 128. So 1.7, 3.4 or maybe even 6.9 megahertz bandwidth, but no more because otherwise you would be taking the whole, whole band yourself. To put it, this to the perspective using MCS4 transmission, which is QPSK rate 3 over 4 coding, uh, you can achieve a peak data rate of 3.3 megabits per second. Uh, so, and why a four slot transmission here? There, the overheads of the packet synchronization and the control channel are quite low. Instead, if you would use a single slot every 10 milliseconds, you can get 
use a single user data rates from 30 to 100 kilobits per second. Of course, split then between 24 users and aggregating from there to that 3.3 or 2.4 me megabits per second. In terms of a link budget, what this means, if somebody is familiar with a typical link budget calculation starting from radiated power, uh, having a quite low noise figure, maybe 5 dBs, and the signal to noise ratio required for, for a modulation of 3.5 dBs, you, you can calculate up to 126 dB link budget for the signal. Free space line of sight equations predict signal range up to 25 kilometers and ITUR 2412 predicts line of sight uh, signal transmission of 2.5 kilometers. Here in the pictures you can see our kind of a demonstration from last summer where the transmit transmitter was located uh, five meters from a lake surface on the top of summer cottage, on the roof of a summer cottage in a lake nearby Tampere region in Finland. And the receiver was uh, put, put to the, on a rowing boat and our, and our brave tester started rowing. And uh, he rowed 6.2 kilometers and still the MCS-1 was working. MCS4, I think, was working more than a more than a five kilometers. And put this to another perspective, uh, testing within a city center of Tampere, measured range in this experiment where the transmitter was at the Tampere University campus, quite, quite close to our our offices here in Tampere. And the other end was in the Tammela region, 650 meters away. So it really depends on the environment that where you have your system, what is the setup, whether you have line of sight. Uh, the buildings do uh, cause uh, significant signal attenuation as the carrier frequency is 1.9 megahertz. So uh, using a lower carrier frequency would help in this perspective. So there, there's going to be a canyon effect in a modern typical city center. But these two experiments give you some picture that what the ranges might be. Now I'm going starting to go a little bit deeper on the physical layer and physical layer details. So the, the packets which are transmitted look like this. So the packet starts with a uh, synchronization training field. And, uh, and uh, in the data field, uh, you have control information and then actual pay payload. The packet length and all the parameters needed for demodulation are in a fixed sized physical control channel which is transmitted on the first two OFDM symbols. The control channel encoding and the actual payload encoding follow a similar kind of a procedure. You in a control channel you have a payload either 40 or 80 bits. You attach a 16-bit CRC to it and channel encode it with a turbo encoder, rate match it to the 90, uh, 98 uh, subcarriers on the OFDM symbols and map the signal to the, to the subcarriers. The receiver doesn't know in advance whether a control channel is a 40 or 80 bit, so it needs to blindly decode it. But Typically, a uh, receiver can deduce it. So if it's receiving a beacon or, or the kind of a control information, 
uh, it's 40 bit uh, payload and if it's a unicast transmission so you're expecting unicast transmission to be received it's then 80 bits but in general receiver needs to blindly decode which one is it once you have decoded it and got the correct crc you can do the actual payload decoding so the payload is encoded in a pretty much similar fashion the only difference is that the uh, the transport block length or the payload size for the actual data channel can vary and it varies according to the length of the packet and used modulation and coding scheme uh, there is a maximum tur turbo code block size which is 2048 so if the transport block size is longer than that then the transmission is segmented which is completely hidden from the up upper layers you don't know anything about it but you attach a crc segmented uh, uh, channel encode the code plot block segments reassemble uh, rate, rate rate match them and segment different code code blocks and then map to the data sub carriers but these are pretty similar procedures for both of those physical channels now once you have the signal to be transmitted in each of each of the OFTM symbols you do the time to frequency transformation and push the data through the RF in the right hand side you have the quite familiar OFTM signal equations uh, in uh, the big S is the frequency domain signal and small s is the time domain signal and the uh, sum equation is the FFT equation taking into account here in this equation the OFTM signals cyclic prefix you can develop this first equation to the equation number two where you have the pulse shape of the OFTM signal uh, visible and typical like in Wi-Fi the pulse shape is once so it's a box car or box pulse shape which results this kind of a transmitted spectrum in in the left hand side so the side bands are quite high and you wouldn't fit to the decked spectrum mask so you have to do something to the transmitted signal before pushing it through the RF to fit to the spectrum mask and one thing you can do so instead of using the rect rectangular pulse shape you can use so-called windowed overlapped pulse shape so the consecutive uh, OFTM symbols are rolled up and rolled down in a power and you can select the pulse shape for instance using uh, this kind of a rule and for instance in this left hand side picture I've used raised cosine pulse shape of three samples and you can clearly see the improvement compared to the previous transmission spectrum or then in further you can use filtered OFDL so you convolve your transmitted time domain signal with a pulse shape, desired pulse shape like square root raised cosine filter and here you can clearly see that you can push the side lobes of the transmission to lower thus you are not interfering too much of the HSN carrier user but that's enough of the transmission uh, a little bit about the synchronization training field so this STF synchronization training field seven or nine repeating small small repetitions of the signal in the beginning of the packet it's a uh, in the left hand side you have a little bit of the mathematics and in the right uh, right hand side you can you can you can see the picture picture so the first versions of the specification did have the synchronization uh, signal defined without this kind of a cover sequence which was introduced 
a few months ago and it's going to be a fix to the specification. So currently in the forthcoming 1.5.1 specification, there, there's going to be a cover sequence applied on top of the synchronization, which means that the uh, each of these uh, individual synchronization periods get multiplied either by one or minus one. So essentially they change phases. So what happens to the signal, the peak to average ratio stays the same, uh, but you can see the difference from 1.4.1 to 1.5.1 specification, the constellation is more kind of a uniform around the origo. Uh, the benefit of doing this cover sequence, we get a higher tolerance to a frequency error. So the receiver will not make as many synchronization errors with a high frequency when you have a high frequency error in the receiver. There are many ways how you can do a packet reception. Uh, you utilize the properties and and the uh, and the signal defined for the how the signal has been defined for the transmission. One way of uh, doing the synchronize uh, time and frequency synchronization is to use the autocorrelation based uh, mechanisms, meaning you are correlating your received signal with a delayed version of it itself. And in this equation, uh, I'm showing you how to take into account in this autocorrelation based synchronization, the cover sequence. The cover sequences are this C and, uh, okay, it's the cover sequence is this C, uh, which has uh, peri uh, as many periods as the synchronization signal has. Here in the, uh, when the, we're using the lowest bandwidth signal, the number of periods is seven. So you have to take this into account in the algorithm. Uh, so uh, this top equation gives you the uh, normalized, uh, you're normalizing the autocorrelation with the received signal power and you get the detection metric, which is in, in the range of from zero to one. If you have a huge, very good signal to noise ratio, the detection metric can re reach up to one. And if you have a lower signal to noise ratio, the re detection metric uh, stays quite low. And based on some criteria, you set detection threshold. For instance, in this picture, it has been 0.3. And here in this uh, autocorrelation based uh, algorithm, you can see that really the problem what we have with the autocorrelation based timing and frequency synchronization is that the packet detection peak is quite, quite wide, especially in the case when you have a multipath propagation. But nevertheless, this is an, an example and uh, how to derive a, a receiver or packet synchronization algorithm. The second thing uh, you uh, need to understand that when you are applying this kind of algorithm, you cannot declare whenever your detection metric, let's take this second lowest picture or the lowest picture, doesn't make sense. Whenever your detection metric is goes ab uh, uh, above set detection threshold, you cannot declare the, uh, the synchronization immediately. Uh, this is due to the side lobes in, in the synchronization sing, sing, signal. So you have to wait until the main peak of the synchronization. So you have to delay the decision that whether you found the correction, correct synchronization somewhat. Channel estimation is the second thing the receiver does when when it uh, when it has reached uh, or decided that this is the beginning of the packet. You use the known 
demodulation reference is depicted here in this right right hand side picture by by these blue dots you calculate so called raw channel mess estimates or least squares uh, channel estimates of those uh, uh, data subcarriers and what you do then is to use some kind of a filter i'm not going to we don't have time here to go to the details but uh, you can optimize uh, a filter which interpolates the channel responses for the whole received packet and those you use for demodulation the demodulation here are a couple of equations you when you when you have received certain signal value what the demodulation does it tries to deduce what was the most likely transmitted data bits for in a particular OFDM symbol the demodulator produces so kind so called soft information or soft bits which are log likelihood ratios or probabilities of whether certain bit was transmitted as one when you have received some signal and you can use bias equations here to uh, find out the details how the demodulation is is done what i can say is that whenever the complexity of the modulation increases in the certain sub carriers more complex shall the receiver uh, algorithm be in, in when it does the demodulation uh there are many favors of uh, uh automatic re uh, repeat request the simplest uh, arq mechanism just retransmits if it, if it has information that the recipient didn't receive the packet correctly recipient in this case doesn't have any responsibilities it just tries to decode demodulate and decode and if it fails it sends an information to the transmitter that i didn't receive anything can you please repeat improved version of of it is this chase combining hybrid arq these bit lock likelihood ratios uh, of the received bits are stored in the receiver and once uh, uh, and the transmitter retransmits the packet so the receiver does uh, combining of those bit probabilities based on the original transmission and then the repeated transmission and then there is a third third version of the ARQ or the second version of the hybrid ARQ is that the transmitter is not sending exactly the same information every time or resending exactly the same information every time the receiver stores the bit probabilities from the previous transmission attempts and combines them with that additional information it receives in the in, in the retransmission the only problems with a hybrid arq in either form are is that the memory requirements of the receiver increase linearly dependent on the maximum transport block size number of processes transmission processes per user and number of simultaneously active users the problem is very similar as a cellular base station the problem uh, or the difficulty of the problem how many simultaneous connections you need to support how much memory you require to do that small uh, uh, finally a small detour to the forward error correction coding and this hybrid ARQ what actually happens so we do have strong forward error correction coding defined in the standard it's a rate 1 over 3 turbo encoder in the top right hand side you see a logical picture how this kind of a turbo encoder works you feed it in with this blue bits s one output are the systematic bits 
the same bits you put in. Then you have, for instance, now as we have one over three code, you will get two additional red, redundant informations, uh, redundant bits. And in this case, in DEC, what happens, these redundant bits are arranged in this kind of order. They are multiplex, they are alternating. And when the transmission is done, and for instance, I think I have a better picture. Okay, I have of the chase combining situation, but let's go with this first. So when uh, the code rate, for instance, MCS1, modulation and coding scheme one, is rate one over two code. So for every information bit, you are sending another redundancy bit. The uh, rate matcher selects these bits depicted here as RV1 as the initial transmission. And sending those over and discards sending any other, other bits. The retransmission in a hybrid ARQ is then, uh, if, if the transmission fails and the other side communicates back that the transmission fails, the retransmission is done using RV2, redundancy version 2. So starting from this pink uh, 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 parity bit, you're transmitting all, all of them or nearly all of them, plus them, then some additional uh, systematic bits. Some people have been complaining or I've heard stories that uh, why turbo encoding, but you need to understand that actually turbo encoding and decoding is simpler than convolutional encoding and decoding. Who says that you need to do n iterations all the time? If uh, your decoding succeeds in the first iteration, meaning you have a correct CRC, or you otherwise decide that this decoding shall uh, converge or it shall not converge, you can stop the decoding. The number of states here in this turbo encoder is quite small. It's eight state turbo encoder. The decoding, of course, you need to do the forward pass and reverse pass and do the interleaving and do the CRC check, but still it's simpler than the constraint length seven convolutional code. In order to save a little bit time, uh, I will go through this very quickly. So what happens in the chase combining? So when you have encoded your systematic bits and parity bits like this, and you're only sending the colored ones and do not send the these white ones, and your initial transmission fails, you get retransmission. You sum the probabilities or sum the so, uh, uh, log likelihoods of these bits, you get additional 3 dB gain for for that first retransmission. But nothing else, you do not get coding gain. But what happens in the incremental redundancy? I will go to this picture immediately. When you have your initial transmission, sending majority of the systematic bits and half of the parity bits, your decoding fails, you send a retransmission request to the other side, and the other side then transmits your the uh, retransmission. It transmits redundancy version two. So in this redundancy version two, it's sending majority of the parity bits, some of the systematic bits, you add them together. Thus, you have now information for complete one over three code, Plus then some of the bits have been sent twice. You get additional 3 dB boost for those bits. So all together in a static channel, the retransmission get, gets up to 5 dB boost due to the hybrid ARQ compared to the 
3 dB of a chasing, uh, chase combining or 0 dB of a simple retransmission. A couple of final things to conclude my presentation and I understand that this has been quite fast skim through the material but is that uh, we do have a link adaptation uh, in, in, in the physical layer and in radio layer. So each of the control channel or transmitted packets in the control channel declare the transmission power. So you tell with the four bits that I used 23 dBm or 10 dBm or minus 20 dBm for transmitting this packet. packet. Thus the recipient can know when it receives the uh, packet, it can calculate that what has been the path loss. It can use this same path loss to the reverse direction. So why to boost the transmission power to the full if lesser transmission power is sufficient? Secondly, when uh, transmissions fail or succeed, there is going to be an MCS or there is an MCS adaptation. Thus, if, if your transmissions typically fail, you would start using more robust uh, MCS. And secondly, uh, the retransmissions, uh, while we are using that hybrid ARQ, they get that additional few dBs coding gain. So uh, if you are in the borderline that your kind of initial transmission has just failed due to the link conditions, typically the first retransmission is already successful. So you don't need to repeat it a million times if the conditions uh, haven't changed drastically. Then my Final slides are actually a teaser to the next presentation. So we are working on our first uh, in Nordic, we are working on our uh, first uh, silicon products. And we have working radio transmissions currently using our previous generation. So 9160 has been our development platform and we are going to productize what we have been doing in 9161. And shortly there will be a 9161 uh, based dev kit available, but uh, Lauri will talk more about these dev kits in, in his presentation. So I think I've used my 40 minutes, Royal. So back to you. Thank you very much, Heike, and you've used them well. So yeah, thanks very much for your presentation and uh, calm and collected uh, explanation of some of the details of this uh, powerful new technology. Um, so perhaps it wasn't so easy for everyone to follow all the, the, uh, the mathematics, but we do have some, uh, some questions. Um, but before we go to those, I'd just like to uh, talk about the uh, fifth and sixth webinars. Um, and the fifth one, uh, as you already explained, is about how to get started with the uh, with NR plus. Um, so we'll talk about the, uh, the chipsets and the development kits, and also how uh, you know the companies working with this WirePass and Nordic uh, can provide uh, support to people who want to get started. Uh, we have decided to actually run these two webinars in one session uh, to be held on the 9th of November. And that is in conjunction with uh, our annual DECT World event, which will take place in Munich this year. Uh, people will be able to call in online as uh, we've done before. But of course, if anybody wants to join the conference, they're very, very welcome. And if, and if you do, you will be able to find out much more about uh, Decked in R plus and also meet uh, people from both Nordic and Wireplus. So, I very much invite you to uh, to join us there. If not, you can uh, call in, uh, and invitations will be uh, will be sent out. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this webinar again. Uh, and uh, if you want to be part of shaping the NR plus journey, then uh, you can join us at the Tech Forum. Uh, the links in the presentation. Uh, or you can always contact me for questions. 
And with that, uh, let's just look at the questions that have come in. Um, to start with the first one, does the 10 dB link budget improvement include the use of uh, forward error correction and ARQ, or do we get this from OFDM alone? There is no magic in a sense in OFDM, so it's purely a, a, a mostly kind of a forward error correction coding. And in, in, in a sense that when we have multipath fading channel, it doesn't basically give you the OFDM itself, it gives you the facilities to do a simpler receiver. So you could actually do it with a, a GMSK as well, but your receiver would be quite complex. So forward error correction coding and ARQ, that's my answer. Okay, uh, second question. What is the performance criteria for the required signal to noise ratio of three and a half decibel? Well, basically that's the MCS1, MCS1 10% uh, packet error rate. You, re you need three and a half dBs. Mm -hmm. And that's, cal that's basically uh, calculating in all the implementation losses. Okay, I hope that answered the question for the person uh, asking it. Of course, you can always come back to us if you have additional questions and um then the next one any idea of ofdm benefits in indoor versus other technologies have uh, tests been made indoor also yes we made our, our first tests and we are doing tests in indoors out, out, uh, as well it's the resilience to the multipath propagation as well especially for instance in the stadium conditions which are quite large rooms i admit i mean 150 times <laughs> 200 meters where the uh, classic deck had really serious problems. This OFDM based signal doesn't have any problems. So it's a kind of a resilience to the multipath propagation, which gives the OFDM its most of the benefits. Okay, thank you. Um, then regarding synchronization for good performance, is a simple autocorrelation of the received signal sufficient or does one also need to cross-correlate against a pre-calculated template of the synchronization training field? Uh, autocorrelation based uh, implementation is good enough for six dBs and higher. So uh, if you or around that kind of a 5 dBs and higher signal to noise ratios, you are able to use the autocorrelation based synchronization uh, in static uh, or in one tap, which is kind of a static channel, channel conditions. For good performance, you need some coherent means of doing it. So cross correlation based synchronization. And I might add that the cross correlation based synchronization is simpler than autocorrelation based one. It might be a surprising, but it performs better and it's simpler. Okay, questions are getting more advanced. Uh, so uh, just read through it. Uh, I guess you can also see them, uh, Heike, but uh, is there any control over the ARQ for higher layers to decide uh, request latency? The scenario is optimizing power consumption in sensor networks, assume the deck in R plus between gateways with low data rate and very long latency accepted. Uh, avoid instant retry of the packets loss with default redundancy and FVC. Uh, yes, I would say that there is a control. Uh, the, the, there's a response window defined in the standard for the responses. I, I don't remember the details uh, from top of my head. I can check them out. But um, what I can say is that typically the standard defines and we have the capability to send the ARQ request within one slot. So we are, as we have received the packet, decoded it, we are able to send a response packet back that retransmit or not. That's within one slot. That of course can be as well delayed. There's a response window defined for that. But then the other end can schedule how fast it uh, re does the retransmission. And now here you must 
pay attention also that how many simultaneous connections you might might add longer you delay the response back or the retransmission uh, you might need to buffer the data both in the transmitter side and in the receiver side so that affects the implementation okay thank you so the next question is how does the receiver know the correct tbs is it directly taken from the table as in lte and if so why is there an option for filler bits before encoding actually uh yes um you're correct if you have read it but also in the specification it says that uh, in all scenarios you should actually calculate the number of tbs to zero oh, oh sorry uh, the filler bits to zero but uh, reiterating my answer maybe is that the control channel uh, tells you the physical control channel tells you the modulation and it tells the packet length modulation and coding scheme and the packet length using these three parameters uh, you calculate the transport block size in a way that filler bits are not needed. So control channel actually tells you the TBS side uh, size. Okay. Next question: Why DRS symbols do not cover the edge uh, subcarriers when having a single antenna? This complicates the interpolation process and CSI estimation for edge subcarriers. Uh, in order to uh, that was a decision made during the standardization to keep the interpolation pattern exactly the same regardless of the number of transmitted antennas. Thus, you wouldn't need different kinds of a mechanism for different antenna configurations. Mm -hmm. does, not, does not have impact to the performance. You can extrapolate those, uh, those uh, few carriers uh, which are needed. Okay. Um, now, some countries allow DEC to operate only in 1910 to 1920. Uh, there are also other uh, frequency bands, by the way, uh, but they're all quite limited. That's uh, that is true. But um, because of the uh, WWPN networks on the vicinity, is DEC and R plus able to operate on this reduced band? Yes. It, it is so uh, and it really depends on on the implementation uh, our implementation currently when you're using the decked band uh, all the channel numbers from 1880 up to uh, 1930 i guess are available available for you to use so currently we haven't yet implemented any band specific restrictions so um, as we have been mostly working currently on, on the physical layer. In future, it might be so that uh, the, there will be in the implementation band specific uh, restrictions. Thus, when you say that you operate on band nine or whatever is your band number, you get only uh, certain channel numbers available for your higher, higher layers. But yes, it can operate on, on, a, on a reduced band. Short answer. Mm. Okay, now we have the last question. So, why is the preamble with numerology mu is one equal to 14 over nine symbols and instead for mu two is more regular than is equal to exactly two symbols? Over, overhead reduction. That's the simple answer. It. So, uh, the card interval which is left which is, 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 is it five over nine out of that? So I cannot calculate from that top of my head, but nevertheless, it's overhead reduction uh, thing. If we would have used, I mean, single OFDM symbol wasn't enough for the performance required. So we ad needed additional uh, training fit periods. We didn't have the luxury to use two full OFDM symbols 
because that would uh, have more burden or take away capacity of the actual uh, payload data. So that was a compromise why we ended up in that kind of a nasty symbol or nasty definition, but it's an overhead reduction compromise. Okay. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, this was the last question. And uh, thank you again very much, Heike, for the presentation and the answers to uh, all these uh, detailed questions. Um, very good to see those. And I see still a lot of people in the call. So um, I think this has been very much appreciated. And from our side, we very much appreciate your uh, participation today. And we hope you will join us uh, the next webinar uh, on the 9th of November either online or, uh, or in the conference. And uh, thank you very much, and I wish you a very nice day. Goodbye. Bye-bye.